What is life's greatest mystery? Maybe Atlantis? The Bermuda Triangle? Or why the dentist tries to talk to you when he's wrist deep in your mouth? If you said any of these, you'd be wrong. Well, not too wrong because that dentist thing really confuses me. But anyway, the real greatest mystery of life is how the f my dumbass got anywhere in this Nuzlocke. Welcome to Can I Be Pokemon Soul Silver in a Hardcore Randomized Nuzlocke? I'm gonna assume that all you watching are just completely dumb, stupid Sigma YouTube content consumers, and one, have never seen a Nuzlocke before, and two, don't know what the word random means. So, I'll lay out the rules. Pokemon Nuzlocke has a few very straightforward rules. Rule number one, you may only catch the first Pokemon you encounter in each route. Rule number two, if Pokemon faints in battle, they straight up die. Now you may be wondering, Dimitri, what do you mean by die? It means they're banished to the realm of pixelated oblivion, never to experience the joy of battle again. AKA, they're banished to the box. Rule number three, you gotta nickname every Pokemon, so that when tragedy strikes, you can wallow in the depths of your own sadness while desperately pleading for the lives of your favorites. Now you may be thinking, wow, this sounds like a really hard challenge, Dimitri. How could you ever make it hard? Okay, shut up, child. It's actually a hardcore Nuzlocke, so that means we add even more rules onto it. Rule number four, no healing items in battle. So, when we're in the Elite Four and members start shoving drugs into their mons, I can proudly say that mine are all natty. Rule number five, I can only level my Pokemon to the same level as the next gym leader's ace Pokemon. Now, I may or may not have forgot about this for the first gym, but nonetheless, the run is still valid. To top all this off, all Pokemon in the game have been replaced with entirely new random mods. This means that my rival could have a whole team of just legendaries, which means I'm playing this game completely blind. All the Pokemon changing is crazy enough, but I'm masochistic and I want to subject myself to eternal suffering. So, the Pokemon movesets have been randomized, as well as their abilities. So this means that my rival could have a Mewtwo with Wonder Guard and the God of time signature move for of time. In short, this is a scary run because literally anything could happen and no one is ever safe. And that brings us to the end of the rules and changes so now we can actually get into the run. Enjoy the video. Oh, also all the recordings came from my live stream on Twitch so feel free to drop by there when I do another challenge so you can be one of those I was here bots. So to get right into it, I named myself Dimitri because duh. I fly past my mom because screw that woman and I make my way to the professor's lab to receive a slave for my 10th birthday. Chikorita, Cyndaquil, Hop it. Something has to be wrong, right? There's no way the odds I get two starters and just a random thing. I'm conf I'm like actually confused, right? Yeah, um, I don't know if I got really unlucky or something, but two of the starters were just the same. I actually think they were still randomized because if you look closely at Cyndaquil's name, it's in blue, which means that's where Totodile is supposed to be. Anyway, with our only real option being Hoppet, I pick him, I name him Fred, and we go on our way. That is, until I get stopped and verbally harassed by the professor, where he forces his phone number on me. I've always dreamt of receiving unsolicited calls from professors. What an honor. Finally, once he gets off my ass, I step into the grass and see if this game was actually randomized. Also, I don't have balls at this point, so the Nuzlocke catching rules don't Start till I get some, and having no balls is canon to the Dimitri lore. I'm gonna assume that that's randomized, but to be honest, I don't really know. Uh, also, that's terrifying for me. I still, dude, I start with Leaf Storm and Leaf. <laughs> what? That's actually crazy. That was a crazy two move. My God, I thought it was just gonna be a, like a toss away pick, but Fred might carry us here. So yeah, Fred's gonna help us out a lot with that moveset. We also ended up checking his ability, and let's say that is bad bitch o'clock. Oh brother, this guy stinks! It's thick fat. Laugh, it was funny. Anyway, this is a crazy ability for Fred because it ups his resistance to fire and ice type moves, which are his weaknesses to begin with. Unfortunately, this will change when he evolves, which definitely won't have any serious consequences. I would consider keeping him as a Hoppet, but sadly the Eviolite wasn't introduced till Gen 5, which makes it not worth it. We end up making our way to Cherry Grove City and end up in Route 30, where I just casually encounter a wild Suicune. Yep, this is terrifying. Thank God he's only level 3. I told you this could happen, but Arceus himself spared our lives. Oh, I also forgot to mention that all the ground items are randomized too. Yo, what's up, Jordan? Um, how you doing on this fight? What the? What's the first thing I find is a lucky egg, bro? I swear to God, why is my luck so good right now? That's around this time is when people started realizing that they could redeem push points to make me do push-ups. Another reason why Dimitri is canonically a masochist. Yes, yes, I know, I'm, I'm so strong. Put the cameras away. After I finished the push-ups, we went and talked to Professor Oak and got sent on a side quest, which in all honesty, I'm gonna skip that part and just cut to when the Nuzlocke starts. So we finally get balls. And we step into the first patches of grass to reveal our first encounter of the game. Okay, I'll close my eyes. I'll close my eyes and try to do it just off, just off the cry. But it's probably gonna be a nose pass, right? Is that a Tauros? It's Ricky! It's literally Ricky. It's literally Ricky. 
I know, it's crazy, right? Ricky, from one of my past playthroughs, had defied all odds and broke through sea of nose passes to join our team. We check his ability and it's snow cloak, which is situational but could save us if he makes it to the ice gym. Shortly after that, I caught a hoot hoot in Route 31 and they don't glizzy. Glizzy makes me want to die constantly through this run. You'll see why later. Oh, he also has battle armor, so he can't be critted. After making it to Violet City, I explore the town a bit and check out the surrounding rounds, only to meet God himself when walking into the ruins of Alf. In this region. <laughs> Something tells me that's not supposed to happen. What is going on? That's terrifying. That's actually terrifying. After I restarted my game and got on God's good side again, I made my way to Sprout Tower. In here, I catch a glam meow and we name it Wego Gym because look at that physique. Wego Gym has the ability Tangled Feet, which raises evasion when confused. Again, situational, but could be useful. After clearing out Sprout Tower and committing a mass genocide on the local Pokemon population, I came to the realization that my dumbass forgot an encounter in Dark Cave. So I backtracked and caught myself a Slow King. We named him Stroganoff and he probably came with one of the worst abilities possible. Stall. And if you don't know what this is, you're lucky because this ability means that Stroganoff is too busy stroking himself off that he always moves last. After doing a bit of training to bring our team up to level, we make our way to the first gym and face the master of flying types, Falkner. I lead with Stroganoff, while Falkner leads with Combi. What a loser! I bet he doesn't have a terrifying second Pokemon or anything. One water spurt from Stroganoff puts it to rest and he sends out Sableye. This is where I started running into problems. If you don't know, in Gen 4, Sableye has no weaknesses, meaning this guy can tank almost all my moves. So I created a genius plan on the spot. We swap in a Wego Gym to scout out some of his moves and maybe hit him with a poison gas. From there, I would wing it. It was a great play. Sadly, my plan did not plan very well, and Wego Gym was one shot by a crit night slash. Oh, and if he didn't get crit, he would have survived to see another leg day. With his bold sacrifice, we switch into Ricky, the MVP. I soon realized that my big brain has big brain damage, and I sent in my fighting type into a ghost type, and the only move that Ricky can do damage is Chatter, which is all fine and good until Faulkner and his Sableye start plotting something nasty and raise their special attack not once but twice. So obviously the thing I needed to do was some push-ups to clear my mind. Okay, so if Sableye hits a special attack, Ricky will die, but the AI decided that it wanted an extra chromosome for Christmas and went for a nasty plot again, giving Ricky the opportunity to kill him. And with that, we claimed our first gym badge. Now that I made some money from fighting the gym trainers, I buy some balls and get to the surrounding encounters. On Route 32, I caught a Luxray and named Ace after my dog. Baba Boy. Ace has the ability Early Bird, which is also situational and I'm beginning to realize that all of these abilities are situational, but it could be useful if he gets roofied. Then, in Union Cave, I catch a Barboach and name him Pistol. I ain't paying a piss. Then, on my way to Azalea Town, I have a panic-inducing encounter with a Dragonair that keeps using Dragon Dance to increase its attack. Thankfully, with Glizzy's help, I put it to sleep and managed to catch it. I name it Gobbler, and its ability, Hypercutter, is actually quite beneficial, as it prevents the attack step from being lowered. After wiping the floor with Team Rocket's pathetic ass and catching a Snover named Slobunnies, <laughs> Slobunnies no. I make my way to the second gym leader, Bugsy. I lead with Ace, and he leads with his Ace Pokemon? What? I was planning to set up charges on Ace to up my special defense, but Mr. Mime had other plans. Mr. Mime has Seed Play, which with his special attack proves to be a deadly combination. Ace took massive damage, so I switch into Fred for the resistance. Good choice, right? Well, not when he lowers my special defense harshly two times in a row. I had to get Fred out of there, so I switched to Glizzy to try and take the last two Seed Flares it has, and he would have been able to tank two of them, but he crits the Seed Flare, and Glizzy's in very deep trouble. At this point, I don't really know what else to do, so I make a stupid decision to use Bounce and hope I'm faster to waste the last Seed Flare. Spoiler, I'm not faster, but somehow Glizzy dodged the last Seed Flare and proceeded to show us a truly awe-inspiring strategy of attacking air. Thanks, Glizzy. But because he's out of seed flares, I switch to Stroganoff and finish him off. The rest of Bugsy's team falls easily to a leaf blade from Fred on the Feebas and a couple of bounces from my man Glizzy on the Silcone. Somehow, I made it out of that battle with no casualties and claimed my second game badge. On my way out of Azalea Town, Jordan tries to pick a fight with me. He leads with Pikachu and I lead with Ace. And this is the perfect situation right now because Ace will resist all his electro type moves. And since Pikachu is a special attacker, I thought, why not use charge and up my special defense? And then I got crippled by this rodent, which I didn't even know was possible. Tell me this is a Mandela effect or something because I thought electro types couldn't be paralyzed. What is going on? Then Pikachu hits us with a Thunderfang, so my efforts of upping my special defense were in vain. So out of pure rage, I send him to the Shadow Realm with a roar of time. The Ginger then sends out Quilava, so I swap to Stroganoff. We knock it out with two brines and prepare for his next Pokemon. Zigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigazigaz
of legends. Later, in Route 34, I catch a Grovile, and naturally, I name him Gecko to save on my car insurance. I put him in the box to save him for later because he's a great encounter. Oh, and by the way, on this route, I may or may not have had a little mishap with Ace. He met his doom to Mario reincarnated as a bug. Rip Ace. You are a good boy. Shortly after, we were blessed with some good news though. Fred evolved into the skip bloom, which is great and all, but he loses thick fat, leaving him with a four time weakness to ice instead of two. Surely this won't have any issues in the future. <gasps> Fred just died. <laughs> Fred! Fred! Oh, I'm so dumb! I'm so dumb. I'm so dumb it hurts. I'm so dumb it hurts. <coughs> He probably gets obliterated by a dugong because my dumbass forgot it was an ice type. Anyway, it seems although that I'm the worst member of my team, aside from Glizzy, my next encounter is a fucking ho -Oh, which at this point in the game is just a throwaway encounter because I had 13 balls to catch a Pokemon with a 0 .08 catch rate, even while under the influence of Glizzy's special blend. So I attempted a few throws just because why not, and to prevent any more casualties, I had to put the Majestic Bird down. With our team in shambles, I decided to recruit Gobbler, Gecko, and the mighty Pissed Hole. I ain't paying a piss. And with a little bit of training, we were ready for the fight with Whitney. With my brilliant intellect, I came up with a plan. Dragon dance with Gobbler, and then sweep her team. The battle begins, and Whitney leads with Geodude. Gobbler starts dancing as if he was a child on Dance Moms. I was watching him like one of those psychotic moms. Unfortunately, my verbal abuse must have traumatized him because he took massive damage from an earthquake, so I'm forced to switch out, which ends up wasting my boosted stats because a plus one Dragon Claw wouldn't kill. I swap to Glizzy to render his earthquake useless, and Glizzy does what Glizzy does best, and root- I mean, goes for a sing, and he misses. He takes a rock climb somehow and survives with 3 HP, forcing me to switch. And now, making his debut appearance, the underleveled Gecko comes out. And he comes out swinging with a lackluster violet, and then gets instantly killed by a rock slide. Damn, I don't know what I was thinking either. Taking advantage of the free switch, I send in Ricky and kill with a rolling chip. Why I even bothered with Gecko when Ricky could have handled it all along? Don't ask me to be smart, okay? Just don't. <laughs> Winnie sends out her ace, Torkoal, and Ricky kills it with one force palm in close combat. We then proudly claim our third gym badge, and with only one casualty, we continue our journey, asking ourselves how the hell Glizzy is still on the team. On our way up to commit hate crimes against Pseudo Wudo, Glizzy makes us a little more proud and evolved, creating his old ability for Scrappy, which lets him hit ghost types. Glizzy has now turned into our one-stop shop for dealing with demons, and I mean, who needs an exorcist when you have Glizzy, right? Oh, and we also took a stop in National Park where we just met God himself. My my favorite Pokemon is definitely Garantina though. Hands down, Garantina. It, 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 Bro, God? God? God is in the grass! Anyway, we get back to deforestation, and we absolutely obliterate the Heracross the size of Sudowoodo. In Route 37, we were once again blessed with a legendary. Unfortunately, I was extremely broke, and my welfare check hadn't come in yet, so I literally had no balls. I threw whatever I had and prayed for a lucky catch, but sadly, I didn't manage to secure the Majestic Bird. Definitely a skill issue. After what felt like ages, we finally made it to Ecrotic City. After some exploring, we made our way to the Burn Tower, because, you know, nothing screams good idea like wandering into a burning down building. In the tower, we come across Jordan, who apparently hadn't learned his lesson yet, and still wanted to challenge us. Jordan led with Spoink, and I led with God. Gobbler. Spoink turns out to be nothing more than just setup fodder for Gobbler, so we proceed to flex our dragon dancing moves and sweep his entire team. Get shit on Jordan, no one loves you. And to be honest, I was genuinely surprised to make it out with no deaths. Tell you where to improve? I, I got you, I got you homie, don't even sweat it. Energy ball. No! <laughs> Dude, uh, I spent this whole episode training him. I spent the whole episode training him. Rest in peace, buddy. You died so young, never knowing the difference between snow bunnies and slaw bunnies. Life can just be so cruel. So with a heavy heart and desperate need for a replacement, we trek through Mount Mortar and manage to catch a bay leaf. We name him Banana because, well, he looks like a banana. Don't ask me why, it just feels right. We continue on with our new and improved team. We reluctantly do a bit of training, and by a bit, I mean the absolute bare minimum. I'm sure this won't come back to bite me in the ass in any way, shape, or form. Anyway, just when we were chilling and pretending to train, my homie, Beetle Boy, decides to rate us. Shout out to my man, Beetle Boy, for interrupting our procrastination session. Oh, and let's not forget about the wild Abra that tried to make Pistol pay to piss. With the training session cut short and Pistol still recovering from the Abra incident, we make our way to the fourth gym. Now, prepare yourself for a shocking revelation. I struggled. Yep, navigating a gym puzzle designed for kids turned out to be a Herculean task for me. I may or may not have resorted to pulling up a map. I thought this was supposed to be a straightforward child-friendly game. Clearly, I overestimated my own genius. After finally stumbling through the gym puzzle, we face off against Morty. He leaves with Meta Knight. He leaves with Metatite, and I, being the strategic genius that I am, I send out Gobbler. The plan? Well, it's the same plan as all our other major battles. Spam Dragon Dance on Gobbler and sweep with Dragon Claw. It's foolproof, I promise. And luckily for us, the AI decides to gift us some free setup turns by being a dumbass. Instead of using Workup to boost its defense and attack stats, the Metatite goes for Nasty Plot. It's only a
With some well-placed Dragon Claws, we take down the Rotom, Rapidash, and Mayan. Easy peasy, lemon squeeze me. Morning never stood a chance. And just like that, we probably walk away with our fortune badge on a team that's still intact. Yeah, you better believe it. We may be brain dead and lazy, but we're also really good at this Pokemon thing. On my way up to the Lake of Rage, you know, where the whole angry Gyarados plotline thing waits, I stumble upon the most fearsome, terrifying Pokemon in this entire run. A Swalot. I can practically hear your laughter and confusion. Dimitri, really? That's not even a good Pokemon. What are you good- Hold on a second. This little Swalot has Wonder Guard. The absolute best ability in this game. And guess what? The only member of my team who can hit it super effectively is Pistol. Because apparently, Stroganoff forgot to learn any psychic type moves. Bravo, Stroganoff. So naturally, I bring in Pistol to deal with this monstrosity, only to be greeted with a Toxic on the switch in. Pistol manages to land a pathetic mud shot, dealing a laughable amount of damage, but then promptly misses the next one. And let me remind you, this move only has a measly 5% chance to miss, but fear not. With the power of an Orenberry that I conveniently forgot to mention earlier, Pistol narrowly escapes what felt like a death sentence. With our pants thoroughly pissed, we arrive in the Lake of Rage, only to realize that I, in my infinite wisdom, don't have Surf yet. So we backtrack all the way to Ecrotite City, beat the living shit out of a Team Rocket Menru, and claim our shiny Gyarados in the Lake of Rage. Spoiler alert, it was Sabini. I was initially excited, but then I remember that it needs an oval stone to evolve and well being a baby pokemon kind of sucks it has the worst stats known to mankind great the only shiny i will literally ever get is useless with the lake cleansed and our spirits slightly dampered we run into lance who needs our help to take down the team rocket base yeah you know the the 10 year old on his pokemon adventure yeah he needs to help battle terrorists this guy right here in the base i cap the cloister and i am bing still yeah i may or may not have misspelled bing chill but you know get past it we take down the admins and then all the electrodes powering the machine. Now, with that whole terror situation behind us, we set our sights on the fifth gym. But oh my god, how foolish was I to underestimate the challenge that awaited me. During one of the gym trainer battles, my overconfidence gets the best of me. I get cocky and try to level up Pistol by switching him in on Aloha to Polion, thinking it would be an easy kill because he was lead cheated. Well, guess what? Napoleon had other plans and made Pistol pay the ultimate toll to piss, aka his life. That's a pee joke. I'm a comedic genius. Now, in my defense, that Napoleon did not use Hydro Cannon until after the switch. With Pistol gone, we were in desperate need for a replacement, we welcome Gibby, the level 1 Jujulo to our team. And of course, we didn't have nearly enough time to train him properly, but who needs training when you can just wing it, right? So with our underprepared team, we bravely face off against the gym leader. And so, the battle against Price begins. He leaves with the side up, and we confidently sent out Gobbler. Our strategy remains as predictable as ever. Set up those dragon dances and sweep. But alas, Gobbler must have skipped a leg day and takes more damage from the side X hidden power than we anticipated. Our dreams of an extravagant setup were cut short. But with two dragon dances under our belt, we managed to take the duck down. Next, he sends out his ace almost dark. And at level 34, this thing is scary, even for Gobbler. Gobbler's Dragon Claw, amplified by plus two attack, lands on Omastar and does literally nothing. Seriously, it's like we tickled the ancient fossil. In return, Gobbler gets hit with a stone edge and got gobbled himself. It is probably one of the most tragic deaths, but we must push on. In a desperate attempt to avenge our fallen comrade, I summon Banana, our grass type hero with a four times advantage against Omastar. But oh no, the universe isn't done playing with our emotions. One critical hit stone edge later, and Banana is mushed into a smoothie. Rest in pieces, dear Banana. You are our adopted starter, and now you're just a potassium packed member. I did the damage calculators, and yes, he would have survived if it was not a crit. Filled with bloodthirsty vengeance, I sent out Ricky. Ready to pummel the malicious Omastar with close combat. And guess what? We do it. We defeat this monstrosity. But hold your applause, folks, because Bryce isn't done tormenting us yet. He sends out Executor, a grass and psychic nightmare. In my infinite wisdom, I predict a super effective psychic move and switch to Stroganoff. Well, it turns out I couldn't predict what I had for breakfast this morning, and instead of a psychic move, Executor surprises us with Woodhammer. And poor Stroganoff gets splintered into oblivion. Farewell, dear Stroganoff. May you rest in peace, knowing you were finally stroked. Off. Half of my beloved team has been ruthlessly taken by this gym leader, and now it's time for payback. I sent out Glizzy, his soul heavy from the loss of its fallen comrades. Glizzy unleashes a four times effective signal beam, leaving Executor in the red. Executor retaliates with a cotton spore, trying to slow us down. Nice try, but Glizzy is unstoppable. After Price pumps his Eggman full of steroids, another signal beam lands, bringing Executor down to half. Glizzy tanks a Woodhammer like a champ and finishes off the veggie with one last signal beam. Victory is ours, but oh, the price we had to pay. Three key members of our team have fallen, leaving a gaping hole in our lineup. As we mourn their loss, we headed the PC to find worthy replacements. After bidding farewell to our fallen comrades and sending them off to the pixelated afterlife, aka the death box, we gather our newfound replacements. Bing Sil, the cloister. Omelette, the executor, and Cum, the grimer. Look at us, assembling a team of misfits. It's like the Pokemon version of a dysfunctional family reunion. Oh, oh, what? What's this? I've just received a video clip labeled Dumbass Kills Pokemon? Intriguing. Let's see what moment of genius I've captured this time. Why can't I get this thing? Murder him. Murder him. I just died.
are being sued. Dude, I'm not having a good day. I am not having a good day. Ah yes, a classic moment of brilliance where I showcase my undeniable skill. Truly, I'm a master of my craft. Um, okay, so now we add to the team Omelette, Cum, and a Flygon named Walter who I fished up in Opaline City. Finally, a stroke of luck in the encounter department. With our ragtag team in tow, we bravely climbed the lighthouse, only to be greeted by a rather unhelpful directive of go to another city, get some medicine for Ampharos who apparently powers this place, and off we go to venture to yet another city in search of a cure for an electric sheep. This city does have more to offer than just a pharmacy though. It is also home to the sixth gym. Oh, and look at that, it's the Suicune guy. You know, the one with the unpronounceable name. His Pokemon were just a few levels higher than mine, but it didn't really pose a problem because Kum has the glorious toxic and milk drink combo that would melt his young Mega. And boy, did it go according to plan. Sort of. Yanmega decided to throw a curveball at us, and he got a crit on Cum, leaving the Deer Grimer with just 7 HP. Nothing to worry about though, right? Cue the frantic switch to Gibby. He takes a massive hit from Bounce, but ends up taking it out. The man then sends out Lickitung. So, we switch to Ricky, and with a single close combat, we take it out, leaving us with an easy victory. Feeling like champions, we couldn't resist taking group picture. I mean, come on, have you seen a better team? They're looking sexier than ever. With a high of victory still coursing through our veins, we picked up our shady looking pharmacy package and headed straight for the gym. The first trainer in this gym absolutely scared the hell out of me. They had a Kecleon with Arena Trap that nearly had Omelette for breakfast. There must have been some sort of divine intervention from the fallen comrades because Omelette came through with a jaw-dropping 1 HP left. Talk about a close call. However, the rest of the gym trainers proved to be more of a comedy show than anything. Chuck, the gym leader, with those nice-ass pecs, but literally no nipples? Seriously, what's up with that? Was up next. He led with Pupitar, but we were ready. Well, not quite ready. We had to do some push-ups because, you know, you guys hate me. And then we continue. Come steps in, and then instantly steps back out in favor of Ricky. On the way in, Ricky got pepper sprayed, blinding him and lowering his accuracy, but then he takes out the Pupitar with a close combat. Chuck's ace, Jinx, made us a little little bit nervous. I may or may not have peed a little, considering 66% of my team is weak to ice, but with Ricky on the field, I shouldn't have any issues. Unfortunately, because Ricky was still trying to get sand out of his eyes, he misses his first close combat. Jinx hits us with an icicle spear that hits five times and does pitiful damage, so we return with a nasty close combat, wrapping up the battle and giving us our sixth gym bag. Do you hear that? It's the sweet symphony of grinding and training. Because who doesn't love spending hours leveling up Pokemon and listening to the same battle theme on repeat? It's like a soothing lullaby for my sanity. But hey, it's all for the greater good, right? Our team needs to be strong and ready to face whatever is coming next. While doing some training for the next gym, we ended up getting a new encounter near the Safari Zone. We got a Magneton, which we named Elon. What? What's that you say? A Steel type? The best type in the game? Yes. Now we have Elon, Pokemon's version of a genius billionaire. Well, minus the rockets and electric cars. And to be honest, he's a great encounter. I just pray we don't have to bring him out of the box anytime soon. But you know, while I was busy training and enduring the repetitive tunes of Pokemon battle music, something rather unforgettable happens. And I mean unforgettable in the I wish I could forget it kind of way. Seriously, prepare your ears for the auditory onslaught that came my way. Oh, but don't worry, I'm just gonna give you a taste of the torture. Spins over and over again. Yeah. Okay, 777 octotrigentillion, 777 septentrigentillion, well, 777 so septentrigentillion, 777 My no man, how many sevens did you put? In the honor of the seven, we'll name it seven, 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 seven. Training is one of those things that I dread. It's like spending hours at a spa, except instead of relaxing massages, you get relentless battles and emotional trauma. But hey, who needs to hit that perfectly reasonable level cap before tackling the gym? I mean, it's not like those extra levels could have saved us from an impending disaster or anything. Dive in head first and pray for a miracle. That's my motto. Besides, what's life without a little spice? You know, like the kind of spice that makes your heart race, your palms sweat, and your Pokemon fucking die. <laughs> Anyway, we finally make our way to the 7th gym. Jasmine leads with Voltorb, and me, being the king of predictions, obviously, lead with Cum, a match made in heaven because of Cum's Volt Absorb. Cum absorbs the Voltorb's electric move and lands a Toxic, which is supported by a Poison Jet and gives us the KO. Pretty easy, right? Well, then enters Typhlosion, which was her ace Pokemon. Again, I don't know why they keep doing this. Like, what is with these gym leaders and throwing out their ace Pokemon early? I was scared. Like, I was really scared because while training in some grass earlier i was jumped by a typhlosion but we will stand strong and face the fiery beast head up yeah come was one shot burnt to a crisp toasted like a piece of toast you know uh, any other fucking analogies i can bring up you want to know something even more messed up if i trained to the goddamn level cap he would have survived so now instead of training this motherfucker four more levels i gotta train some bastard from the box probably like 30. anyway walter comes out and tags a fire blast oh and would you believe that? He can't even one-shot the fiery bastard. Guess what? Five levels under your opponent doesn't exactly make for a victorious showdown. Shocking, I know. In a stroke of luck, Walter manages to dodge a fire blast and finishes her Typhlosion with another earthquake. Thank God the hard part of the battle is over. Next came out Cranidos, which was promptly taken out with an earthquake, bestowing us with their seventh gym badge. I may have temporarily lost my temper in the process, but who needs sanity when you got seven gym badges and underlevel Pokemon? After the high of victory finally settled, I was left devastated at the loss of my beloved cum. So we put together a little memorial service for him at the death box. We need to pay our respects to cum, the fallen soldier, someone played some bagpipes, 
He's put to rest alongside Bing, Sil, R.I.P., and Stroganoff, and Banana, and Cobbler. But hey, let's not dwell on the Fallen, because guess what? We've got Salami now, and he's no ordinary member of the team. Oh no, he's a legendary. That's right, a bona fide legendary Pokemon. And I was really excited to add him to the team, not just because he's a legendary, but because he also has Motor Drive, which gives us an immunity to electric type moves, just like Cum has. Seeing as I consistently murder my Pokemon from being underleveled, I decided it would be a good idea to try and get an EXP share. If you didn't know, in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, once you defeat the Shiny Gyarados, you get a Red Scale, which can be given to Mr. Pokemon in exchange for an EXP share. I was just scared that it would be randomized. The EXP share. Don't randomize. Do not randomize here. Do I actually have an EXP share? So with our new EXP share, we head to Goldenrod City to progress the story. We headed down to the underground tunnels to get a sexy new outfit and make our way up the radio tower. And on the way, we definitely easily swept a bunch of Team Rocket grunts with no casualties. 100%. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not lying. Oh yeah, also this creepy shit happened. Making our way up the tower, we battled a lot of weak trainers and got some desperately needed levels. That is, until this incident. Um, I don't know what type my hidden power is, so might as well test it out. He's got an Oblast! Omelette, you need to survive. Omelette! Omelette! You bastard! You bastard, Omelette! Oh. <laughs> He's got Wonder Guard. Okay, all the two... St all the two-stage Pokemon never hit their second stage because it takes so goddamn long to evolve. Fucking Kun. And Omelette? What the hell? Sadly, Omelet died without ever evolving, and we had to pull Elon out of the box as replacement and continue our rampage up the tower. We ended up fighting a Team Rocket admin, and to make a long battle short, we crushed him with no casualties and very little scares. We ended up getting a keycard and ventured further into the underground tunnels. But before we could deal with the rest of the Team Rocket grunts, guess who decided to show up? And stats is Magneton, just from... No shot. Not a chance. There's no chance there's a rival battle right now. Jordan. He leads with an Octowl. Somehow, he got a hold of his own Glizzy. Because I was caught off guard, Elon was in the front. So I was forced to make a switch into Walter because he was under level. Luckily, his Noctowl used Lucky Chance, so I basically got a free switch in. But then came a Feather Dance. And suddenly, Walter's Dragon Claw felt about as effective as a wet napkin. Now you may be thinking, Dimitri, why don't you just switch out into another Pokemon? No, 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 no. We're gonna sit here. We're gonna spam Dragon Claw like there's no tomorrow. Because why strategize when you can brute force it? Next came out Mistrevious. I switched to Glizzy for the ghost immunity and get locked in with Mean Look. In my arrogance, I used Defense Order, thinking I was untouchable. Unfortunately, Finally, Mistrevious used Judgment, got a crit, and did half my health. Even with the crit, it was somewhat recoverable because we got a defense boot a crit again. Somehow, Glizzy survived and retaliated with a surf that did nothing. Yeah, at this point, I just had to accept the fact that Glizzy died, all because we couldn't switch out from a mean luck. I honestly never thought I'd see the day that Glizzy died. And for some reason, I was sad. After all this time of hating on him, he kind of grew on me. And now that he's gone, I didn't even get to tell him I loved him. With a heavy heart, we sent out Walter, and he put the rabbit animal down with an earthquake. Quilava comes out next, and he uses Fire Blast, which burns Walter, saving the Quilava from a one-shot. We slack off to recover some health, and then finish him off with the Dragon Claw. But from the combination of burn damage and the Quilava being fast as fuck, we are sitting at half health when Gulpin comes out. We heal again as he lays down Toxic Spikes. Not once, but twice. The sense of fear fills the air when I realize all my Pokemon will be crippled when they sent out. We kill the Gulpin with an earthquake, and Jordan sends out his last Pokemon, Fajorisu. Okay, Walter takes out his frustration on the squirrel with two earthquakes and defeats our rival. We didn't really have to worry about the toxic spikes, thank god, because that would have been really terrifying. And as a replacement for Glizzy, we slot in Best Man the Zubat. At this point, our team is so underleveled because of all the new members. Another casualty would really put us in a bad position. So, we did the bare minimum in training, because who needs to train when you can just walk into battles blindly and hope for the best? And that's exactly what we did, until... I don't want to deal with that. My attack stat's too high. No! No, 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 no! No! No, Walter! 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 Walter, no! Walter, my pride and joy, my sweet baby, my dragon demon was taken from us, all due to my stupidity. Finding a replacement for such a Pokemon wasn't going to be easy, but we ended up settling on Sevens, the Clefairy. Clefairy itself isn't a good Pokemon because it's so weak, but luckily we had a Moonstone lying around and got ourselves a Clefable with Volt Absorb. So let's think for a second. What's the logical next step when my team is in complete disarray and underleveled? Training? Who needs that? I dive headfirst into a Team Rocket executive battle because, well, logic. Proton leaves with Raichu, and I send out the Goat Elon. Raichu hits a few Volt Tackles, and I use Charge Beam on Elon twice to boost his special attack and take him out. 
out with his app cannon. And unfortunately, I got paralyzed in the process. Hariyama comes out next, and at level 33, it's basically a wall of muscle. But fear not, for I have Gibby. Well, not anymore. A double kick from Hariyama turns Gibby into a feathered pancake. It seems like the two-stage Pokemon on my team are never quite reaching their final forms, huh? Might be the under-leveling. With the loss of Gibby and the physical powerhouse that is Hariyama standing in front of us, I sent out Ricky to avenge our fallen ally. Ricky uses secret power and luckily paralyzes the beast. He hits back hard with a powerful double kick that does just under half of Ricky's health. Knowing that a swap into anyone else would result in certain death because everyone was so underleveled, we bit the bullet and took the risky play. You have to kill. You have to kill. Oh my f***ing god, Ricky. Oh my god, Ricky. You blessed soul. Bless you, Ricky. And he kills it. The battle's over and our party saved. All thanks to Ricky, the Giga Chad of my team, the unsung hero, the embodiment of Himothy. Witnessing Ricky's clutch performance must have inspired Best Man, who finally decided it was time to evolve. We needed a new party member to replace Gibby, and our box was not looking too hot. So I flew to Newbark Town and used a fishing rod to start fishing for our replacement. We were blessed with a Rhyhorn. We named him Compensate because, well, you know why. His ability. What else would you be thinking you'd be compensating for, you sick minded f because our team was so underleveled, we had a lot of training to do. And when there are really long training sessions, there's always just random Dimitri lore that gets dropped. We were doing, so it was a health project, right? We were doing a health project about how you need to eat healthy. At the time, Frozen was really popular. I think we were in grade seven. I don't remember, but we were in grade seven. We made a, we had a music parody video of how to, or do you want to build a snowman? It was called, do you want to eat healthy? I wish I could find this video. Oh my God, I wish I could find this video, but I think we all got rid of it. We would always add bloopers at the end of every single thing. So just like five minutes of bloopers too. We literally these presentation videos were like 15 minutes long. The gist of the video is that we knock on the door and we start saying, do you want to eat healthy? I forget all the other lyrics, but I know at some point we threw an orange at someone and we were just throwing healthy foods at them. <laughs> at the time, my room was upstairs right over the hallway going down like over the staircase and we whipped this orange at my friend Josh so hard. It went right by him. It smashed the back of the wall, exploded on the wall. And we had to like attach like a little, um, like wipe the top of a broom just to wipe it. We made such a mess and it was so bad. It was actually the worst thing ever. Anyway, we sweep through the next mini boss, Ariana, with no problems at all. Seems like the new team is putting in the work. After finally making it to the top of the radio tower, we fight Archer? Who leads with Beldum? I threw an Elon. The Beldum does so little damage that he essentially becomes setup fodder for Elon, so we use Charge Beam a couple more times to up the special attack. The next Pokemon really put into perspective how little I actually trained, because the Granbull that comes out was level 38. My highest level was Ricky, a mere level 34. I was terrified. The only option I had was to switch into our Giga Chad and hope for a close combat to kill. Oh, what? He didn't switch? He tries to kill with a move that has 50% accuracy and misses? The Granville also used double team, raising its evasiveness? Dimitri is stupid? Well, we already knew the answer to that one already. So instead of switching to Ricky, I decided that using Charge Beam while being seven levels under was a good idea. Obviously it wasn't, and somehow Elon survives a crit facade. I finally decided to smarten up and make the switch into Ricky, who takes a huge hit from facade on the way in. Ricky won't be able to survive another hit, but with how high of a level this Granville is, I have no choice but to hope I was faster. Actually one shot some with close combat. That's what I'm going for. That's why he's the goat. That's why Ricky's the goat. Ah, <sighs> the smell of victory is sweet, but we're not of the woods yet. Out comes Nidorino, and while Elon would be the best switch, his earlier injuries forced me to choose sevens. He takes a poison jab to the face and passes the baton into best man. And you won't believe it. The opponent gives us a free switch by setting up toxic spikes. We go for a fly, dealing some serious damage, and when Nidorino tries to jab us again, it's all over. And now at this point, I'm starting to question if I'm some sort of Pokemon prodigy or just blessed with incredible luck. Regardless, my team is screaming for levels, or we might be seeing a premature end to the mess lock. Thankfully, a string of trainers and a trek through ice path provided some much needed opportunities to level up. And of of course, there's a new encounter to brighten up our day. Any encounters? There's the encounter, baby. Let's see what it is. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Close my eyes. Dude, that sounds crazy. That's a crazy cry. That's actually a crazy cry. Okay, what is it? Here we go. You ready? Three, two, one. Premier ball. That's what he wants. He wants a premier ball because he's a premium Pokemon. Or she. The she. She's a premium Pokemon. She wants that premier ball. No, no way. No shot catching a premier ball. That's actually pretty sick. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. A premier ball is pretty cool. It's high moon. 
Yeah, the encounter luck is on her side recently, and I don't know why it's doing this to me. I really sacrificed most of my Pokemon. Even if she's temporarily benched, we welcome High Moon to the team. With Ice Path behind us, we reach Blackthorn City. The team is still intact, but crying out for more experience or something bad might happen. I spent the next hour and a half training the team to take on the 8th gym. The level cap is 41, so we have a ways to go. I'll take this time to let you know that I will personally kiss every single one of you who liked this video. If you haven't already, I really appreciate you subscribing while you're down there. This has been one of the biggest videos I've worked on. It's taken me a little longer than it should have. Partway through training, Rufus the Doofus came in to greet the stream. He said hi very briefly and then went to bed because he was tired. But after what felt like an eternity, I finally gave up on training and was left with this team. It was not ideal, but I honestly couldn't take it anymore. My decision to not train any further definitely won't come back to haunt me, right? Well, as we plowed through the gym leaders, reality hit like a ton of bricks. These level 38 Pokemon weren't even the gym leaders' lead Pokemon. But hey, I've always been a fuck around and find out kind of trainer. Who needs excessive preparation where you can just stroll in, sweep her team, and waltz your way to the Elite Four, right? We walk up to Claire, click A. My fate was sealed. I like to call this battle the perfect storm. You'll see why. Claire leads with the Hippowdon, and I lead with Edon. The Hippowdon had drizzle, so in came the rain. And if you don't know, in Gen 4, weather effects last forever unless they're changed by another weather condition. So we're stuck with rain for the rest of the battle. I was forced to switch out Edon because of the type advantage she held over me. So, Salami took the stage. And we got lucky because Hippowdon decided to dig a hole and hide. I figured, why not switch into Best Man for the sweet, sweet ground immunity? And just like that, we got another free switch. Seemingly out of nowhere, Claire withdrew Hippowdon and sent out Gloom. And now, to be honest, I didn't know that gym leaders were capable of this, so I was a little bit thrown off. Best Man used Fly and secured the kill on her first Pokemon with ease. Feeling good, right? But that was just the calm before the storm. Claire sent her ace, Driplum, and at level 41, it was staring at me like it was the Grim Reaper, sealing my fate forever. I brought out sevens for the ghost immunity, and luckily Driplum missed an air slash on the switch. Sevens used power gem, which did pitiful damage for being super effective. Remember how I said I call this battle the perfect storm? Well, this is why. Sevens, you, you're actually garbage. It is grind skin. Why is it set up like this? Why is it actually set up? Why is it set up? Hip out on. Set up the rain for a Driplum Ace with dry skin, so now it has leftovers. Seven slowly chipped away at the balloon until it ate his citrus berry, because why wouldn't it have one of those as well? At this point, Driplum had only been using Grudge, so I didn't know how much of a threat it was until it hit Sevens with an Air Slash, which crit and did three quarters of my health. Not being able to take another hit, I was forced to swap out into Elon and hopefully put this monster down early. On the switch, we tank a pitiful Air Slash, but because of the free turns on Claire's part, her Driplum had almost hit full health from dry skin. Driplum used Nightshade, which did way too much damage on Elon. Thankfully, Elon retaliated with a charge beam that was so close to killing him. I knew that Elon couldn't take another hit, and I also knew that he was so much slower than Driplum. I knew I had to switch, so out came Compensate, and Claire did it again. She swapped out her ace Pokemon into Hippowdon, so I did what I did before, and I swapped into Best Man for the ground immunity. But Hippowdon didn't use Dig, he used Spikes. So now, every time I switch my Pokemon in, it takes some chip damage. And just like what happened before, Claire switched out her Hippowdon, this time sending in Knocked Owl. Best Man unleashed a Sludge Bomb on the Burb, we got Knocked Owl down to the red. And being a gym leader and all, Claire healed her bird using a full restore. Back to square one. Fly lands and does some good damage. Then, instead of attacking us, Noctowl used Defense Order, giving us an opportunity to seal her fate. Unfortunately, with the stat boost, Noctowl survives a gunk shot and retaliates with a low kick, which does nothing. One more gunk shot takes the bird out, but then came Driplum. Still on low HP, I decided to use gunk shot for the kill, and Best Man misses. So we go for another one. What are you doing, Best Man? Hit a shot, hit a shot. You missed two, you're just letting her heal up, you're just letting her heal. During these two turns, Driplum was asking to die. It used Grudge twice, all while the dry skin brings it back into the green health. At this moment, I was getting scared. Best Man then takes a powerful Air Slash as it uses Fly. Not my best choice, considering it was going to give it another free turn to heal, but still, we ended up getting the Driplum back down to the yellow. I made a switch to compensate for the type advantage, but because of the spikes and the fact that he's such a low level, he almost dies on the switch in. I didn't know what to do. Everyone was hurt, spikes were on the ground, and the more turns I waste, the stronger her ace becomes. I decided to send out Ricky and just pray that she wouldn't use Air Slash so I can get an Ice Punch off. The swap happens, and Ricky almost dies. I had to swap again, this time into Salami, who takes the damage from the spikes and the air slash pretty well. Salami is restricted to only using Seed Bomb, because all her water moves would just heal the Driplum, and it does almost nothing. Salami takes a Nightshade, and I'm left wondering how the hell I'm gonna beat this floating nightmare. I figure that I have to swap. I swapped a 7 for the Nightshade immunity, but swapping like this does more harm than good. Not only on every switch in am I taking damage, but on every turn, Driplum heals. I tried using Milk Drink to mend our wounds, but it was all in vain. Sevens took an air slash and met our end. The perfect storm had claimed its first victim, and I prayed it wouldn't take anymore. Out comes Best Man, who almost died from an air slash, but manages to hit a fly. I knew there was no way out of this. We were cornered, so I had to watch Best Man go down fighting. It was a heroic sacrifice. Elin was next on the line. I knew our journey was nearing its bitter end, but I couldn't let it end like this. I used the only potion I had on Ricky, bending the Nuzlocke rules in my desperation to survive. But it came at a dire cost. Elon was ruthlessly struck down by Driftblum's Nightshade. Finally, my last hope emerged. Ricky. Just beneath full health, thanks to the spikes, he was ready to deliver the most crucial ice punch of his life. It was a moment that would decide our fate. I have that now because I took spikes damage. He still has Air Slash. You cannot crit. If you crit, I lose. One shot him, please. <gasps>
shit. You are a piece of garbage. You're a piece of garbage. You're actually a piece of garbage. You cannot do that shit. That was my one out. My one out. The devastating truth hit like a ton of bricks. Ricky, our warrior, fell first. Then compensate met his cruel fate, followed by Salami. Our journey had come to a screeching halt. The perfect storm had won, and I couldn't help but feel like Best Man had been secretly working for the other team with those two consecutive gunk shot misses. It was a heart-wrenching defeat, and I think it all boiled down to my foolish underleveling. But hey, we didn't come this far for nothing, right? At least I got a banging video to share with all of you. If you like the video and want to see more like this, leave a like, subscribe, and maybe bully me in the comments for my questionable Pokemon skills. See you guys.